Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Zeller Berkman, and I'm the academic director of the Youth Studies program here at CUNY SPS. I'm so happy that you guys can be with us here today um, with you know what promises to be an important and also engaging with Michelle Fine. It is always engaging. You know, a good conversation about really how you can use research to support activism or research as activism. Um, before we jump into the day, I want to give you a little bit um, of a context of the broader program that, that this talk sits in and also um, the context for this series that we're doing. And then I'll, get, I'll give you a little brief bio of Michelle and then we'll jump into it. Um, so CUNY SPS, we have a 30 credit master's program and then we have a 12 credit advanced certificate. And our program really caters to um, youth workers, frontline as well as supervisors, um, program managers, activists, advocates, um, and people come from a real broad range of spaces in, in which young people are. So we have um, people that work in, in after school programs. We have, hi, welcome. <laughs> we have people that, um, that work in kind of alternative to incarceration settings. We have people that are in the CUNY system, um, artists, activists, it, it runs the gamut. We have, I'll just mention five of our major commitments to our students. So uh, we really think about marrying theory with practical skills and competencies. Um, we think about contextualizing things in like a, in their historical context and also really um, bringing promising practices um, to our students. We, we are committed to um, intersectionality and looking at how race, class, gender, sexuality, immigrant status, et cetera, impacts young people's development, but also how they're perceived. Um, and we have a participatory and a strength-based approach. And we also, we also um, have a very explicit commitment to social justice. So we think about youth development in the service of kind of upending status quo for and with young people, not necessarily fitting young people into things that aren't working for them. Um, so that's a little bit about our program. You are, I'm not gonna tell you about our classes, but you're kind of part of one of our classes. So we launched a new class this um, winter session. It's an elective on community and youth organizing. And Professor Bendeli is our um, professor for this course. It's an intensive. And part of this intensive, we thought was too good to keep to ourselves. We wanted to really open it up to the field. So we had a talk about um, grit a few weeks ago and really moving from focusing on how to change young people to kind of how to do systems change in partnership with young people. Um, we had a amazing talk with Seiko Dingo, who um, is a former, is a panther and former political prisoner who really talked about the connections between our past and, and the panthers lessons learned in our current youth movements. Um, and today we are so thankful to have um, Professor Fine with us here to talk about um, how you use research and methodological approaches that really um, promote our social justice aims. Um, I'm going to give I'm going to give a little bit of a bio, and this will not do any justice to Michelle. So, so this is a quick and dirty. Michelle Fine is a distinguished professor of critical psychology, women's studies, American studies, and urban ed at the Graduate Center. Her primary research interest is a study of social injustice. When injustice appears as fair or deserved, when it is resisted, and how it is negotiated by those who pay the most serious price for social inequities. Um, she studies these issues in public high schools, prisons, with youth in urban community, using both qualitative and quantitative methods. So I'm also gonna mention, Michelle is very prolific. This book is the last of I don't even know how many, 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 um, and countless articles. I'm going to tell you that one time I wrote something with Michelle, and by the time I got home, 
on the train she had sent out 15 pages like that she's she's amazing um, with her writing but also because she does her work in this deeply participatory way she's had an incredible impact on individuals and also communities and policies um, and she's my mentor and I'm so thankful to have you here today so Michelle welcome thank you thank you Sarah How's everybody? Yeah? We're on stolen land in a crazy nation, in a deeply unequal city. We've got young people who have been taken from their parents a couple of miles from here. And we've got 800,000 people on furlough, just to name the issues that are on the top of my HuffPost list. Um, so I'm going to... I'm going to tell you a little about who I am, the work we do, and then I want to open it up to a conversation about how you might think about participatory practice in your own work. Um, uh, 30 seconds on biography. So I am, I am the young, uh, both my parents are immigrants, and I, uh, my mother was the youngest of 18, uh, Orthodox Jews in Poland, yeah whatever, um, and they came in the 20s at a time that um, Karen Brodkin Sachs called when the Jews became white. It was a time when this country had immigration policies obviously very different than the current moment. It was a time where policies and structures and resources, particularly for white immigrants, were, were kind of like a, it wasn't all easy, but it was like an easy pass into the culture. It's obviously really different than what's going on around immigration. Um, that feels important for me to know that the young people who were housed, having been taken away from their family, that, that could have been my grandmother and mother's story, but it so wasn't, right? And there's the power of white supremacy. There's the power of history. There's the power of class. and. So I think a lot about the privileges that I've had as a white woman, as an academic. Um, and so I kind of feel like we all need to be thinking about these days, to whom are we accountable, right? To, to whom are we responsible? Even those of us in the academy, those of you in schools and communities, um, for whom is our work significant? And uh, anybody else like have a hard time sleeping when you know what's going on in the world? Right? It, it, it's actually, it's hard to walk from 35th Street here without seeing so many people and not knowing, do you give money, do you give food, do you, right? So, so there's a way in which it feels really important for us to take a deep breath for the work that we do, but the movements that we're attached to, to think through, to, to whom are we accountable? Um, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about three projects, and then I hope you too can think about a, a critical, critical turn in your work. Um, I think I want to start with a sweet story. So I, I just, over vacation, I went with uh, my partner. We've been together for, I don't know, 40 years, a million years. Um, we have three kids and a mortgage and you know uh he teaches at saint peter's university he is working class students first gen students so we took 12 of them on a trip to the southwest it was a course an anthro course and we were doing indigenous lands anthropology geography very diverse almost everybody was an immigrant um african-american white latinx filipina liberian uh, we were diverse in a variety of ways. We were DACA diverse. We were three young women on DACA. We were hijab diverse. Two of us were hijab. We were neurodiverse. Two of us had those fabulous brains that know everything. Anybody lucky enough to know someone like that? Um, and we traveled around the Southwest in a van. And when we would show up in restaurants, we were clearly not from the neighborhood. And we were laughing, we all got along real well, and we had a Sunni and Shia, and they had never met. 
a Sunni and a Shia. So, so it was like diverse even in ways that we didn't. Anyway, I was the driver. They were extremely fun. It's really cool to travel with working class kids. They don't complain. Right? Have you ever have you ever like traveled with really wealthy kids? It's like a different story. Um, and they like help when the car gets stuck in the snow and they push the van. Anyway, so we ended up in in uh, yet another white restaurant in Cortez, Colorado, and we're all eating and drinking and not drinking, drinking, drinking and sharing. And a big white guy walks in with four young people and he kind of sits with David and me and he introduces himself. He's a dairy rancher in Texas. Um, he hates the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, because they make him use clean water. He's telling us this story. And then he looks at the young people and he says, so who, who are they? And David says, these are my students. And the guy, not really being obnoxious, I think, said, how do they afford this? And David said, well, they go to school full time. They work full time. They're activists for environmental justice, for Black Lives Matter, against Islamophobia, and around immigration. And their mothers sold a lot of empana extra empanadas in the last few months. And this guy grabbed $200 out of his pocket, and he said, I'm buying you all dinner. And it was like a weird moment so that night, I sometimes do creative nonfiction writing. So that night I was writing and I wrote a story as though I were him, like he had never imagined we could be a country where we all dared to sit together and, and engage in differences and solidarities and share straws. So I offer that because that's kind of the spirit with which we do the work that we do. It's kind of the spirit, it's the fumes upon which CUNY survives, believing in what could be when it's so clearly in a world that is not, this man is gonna save my life a lot. <laughs> I'm good at talking, I'm not so good at that. Um, and I'm not always that good at talking. Um, so we engage in critical research, we being the public science project at the Graduate Center. We're a group of activist scholars who do research alongside and with communities and activist organizations in order to generate, to appreciate the knowledge that already exists in communities, but to generate research for social change, for policy change, for organizing work, for popular education, for theater, right? So revolting is like a joke because it's awful and people are revolting. All right, so I just do that, right? Now I'm good. You, you could go home. Hey, you could retire. So in a moment of state violence, betrayal, and Satanism, we ask, to whom are we accountable and with whom are we responsible? I could tell you about all the people I kind of sleep with, W.E.B. Du Bois, Linda Smith, Vine Deloria, Jane Addams. These are scholars who dare to imagine the world could be different and did their resources, their intellect, and their movements together. Um, but I won't. But I'm happy to answer. That. So I think a lot these days, or we think a lot about solidarity studies. What does it mean, particularly for those of us in public universities, to ally ourselves with movements for change. Does that make sense? Rather than research on or about, research alongside, with, and, uh, and for. So the Public Science Project is a space for critical participatory policy work. We have some simple notions, no research on us without us. So we never go into a community and assume we know, at this point mostly, communities are saying to us, can you help us do some research on aggressive policing in the South Bronx, or the impact of college and prison, or um, foster youth at CUNY, right? All examples of projects we've worked on. So the research is always designed by teams that Maria Torre would call contact zones that are comprised of people with knowledge of the issue because they have paid the most severe price for injustice and those of us who are traditionally trained in research. Does that make sense? Contact zone. And I just want to put a pin in that because, uh, well, I'll come back to it. Um, 
blah, blah, blah. We work with an intersectional, so we're interested in race and class and gender and sexuality and documentation status. Um, the, the point here, though, is that PAR, participatory action research, is not a methodology. It's not like a way to do research. It's an epistemology. It's a belief that knowledge is broadly distributed, but legitimacy is not. So it's a recognition that I'm not the expert when we're studying aggressive policing around Yankee Stadium. I might have something of use, but I should never be doing that research on, by, or for. Always with. Does that make sense? So the most, um, in some ways, the most offensive part of participatory research to my more traditional colleagues is that we trouble the notion of who's the expert. Because we think the people who have most experience in justice are the experts. And we think together we can cook something pretty interesting. Right? Some of my colleagues, Yasser Payne, if you're interested, um, Yasser studies street life. He's a guy who was raised on the streets on 125th Street. And for him, his work is not so much in a contact zone of very differently positioned people. He's interested in working with other men who have led a street life to study street life. Does that make sense? Right? So that's, a, that's a, just a debate worth having. But he, too, like all of our projects, when he was studying street life in New York, he invited a group of street-involved men to the Graduate Center. They were paid. Together, they read how the Academy talks about men who lead a street life. What does the Academy say about men who lead a street life? Raise your hand if you think it says lovely to women. Raise your hand if you think it says contributing to their community, right? They couldn't believe that the street life research was all about misogynistic and violent and um, babies all over the place and lots of mamas and doing nothing for the community because Yasser knew and these men knew that these were the guys who also bought turkeys for everybody during Thanksgiving and bought a lot of the kids Christmas gifts and that the story was more complicated than the dominant story the Academy was telling, which you all probably know the story of young people, young people of color, immigrant young people, poor young people, is so much more complex than the story that the Academy is told. So there's a real commitment to telling a different story. So I'm going to tell you about three projects just to give you a sense of the range of methods and orientations and activisms and then we can open it up. So the first is the Morris Justice Project. Anybody know this one? Nope. You will, too. Um, so Morris Justice is a project in the Bronx around Yankee Stadium. Uh, probably about eight years ago, community members from the Bronx contacted Brett Stout, who teaches at the Graduate Center, and Maria Torre, and a lawyer named Chris Fabricant. And it was really three mothers and grandmothers. And long before some of you were born, they were collecting data out of their seventh floor window, their fourth floor window, and their second floor window. And they were taking pictures of the cops beating up on their sons. And then they were compiling this. And then they were chasing the cops and the kids down to the police station. And they contacted public science and the lawyer and said, we need to systematically document the way the police are treating our children in the 44th precinct. Does that make sense? So there's a recognition, of course, that people knew before we were on the scene. Of course, people had knowledge and were collecting data. But they knew that by connecting with us, they could get a different kind of legitimacy. So in the Marsh Justice Project, um, Brett, Maria, lots of other folks from CUNY, some lawyers and these three moms, a local bodega owner, some of the young men in the neighborhood, some of the young women, they created the research team. And they decided to systematically document community police relations. 44th Precinct, anybody from the Bronx? Yankee, anybody ever hear of Yankee Stadium? Yeah, OK, I got you now. Uh, so uh, they had one of the heaviest rates of stop and frisk, most violent 
some of the most violent stops and the highest innocent stop rate. So like 92% of the stops were innocent, right? So they brought a coalition of folks together and together in the basement of the Yankee Tavern, they developed a survey that they were gonna systematically distribute throughout the community to like every third apartment building and everybody in it. And it was in, in English and in Spanish and they would read at you if you weren't comfortable reading and we gave everybody Metro cards. But it was built from community knowledge. And if, if you go online to the Public Science Project, you can, you can look at all the steps. And it's been, that was a long time ago and they're still doing the work. And when the data came in, they submitted that data to the stop and frisk Floyd legal case. They brought the data back to the neighborhood and said, how do we explain this? They made t-shirts with some of the open-ended data. There's a little one in Maria's office, a child size that says, why do I always fit the description, right? They're now doing work um, with judges, with uh, communities for fair policing, is that what it's called, Community with Make the Road. So when we move into a project, it just becomes kind of a life. I'm gonna show you one scene. Early in the data collection, this was around uh, 2008. It was around Occupy, remember Occupy? Right? If you know Yankee Stadium, you mustn't watch. So Ben and Jerry's uh, had a van that would project data onto buildings. So like they were going to Citibank saying, did you pay your taxes, right? So they called us and they said, look, we've got this van. Uh, can you use it? So the research team, including Jackie Robinson, who you'll meet, uh, who's now one of the chief plaintiffs in the stop and frisk case. They said, yeah, we'll, we'll take the van to the Bronx where we collected all the data and we'll project it up on, an, on the side of an apartment building to kind of let the community know what we have found. This team has then got invited by President Obama to a citizen science conference in New York City and again the whole team went. They all presented at the American Psychological Association. Everybody wore t-shirts saying um, being who I am is not a crime or uh, why do I always fit the description. After they got off the stage to an audience of thousands, the police came up and uh, told Jackie that there could be no protests here. So even when we are reproducing science in science settings, the kind of racist perceptions of who the group is um, linger, right? Um, uh, not yet, because I, there's one more video I actually want to show. Um, yeah, but hold up a sec. Um, but this is like a really powerful project that has been going for like six years. I mean, they all go to each other's babies and funerals and they're just tight. And it's, it's uh, Jackie, like I said, was the lead defendant in the stop and frisk case. But there's a, there's a real um, blending of the kinds of expertise and wisdom and a shared commitment to what it means to be an activist scholar. They then go back to the community and do what they call sidewalk science. So they put up little signs on every street corner about the number of stops that happened on that street corner so that people are aware of it. Um, when Derek Jeter retired from Yankee Stadium, they made a little, uh, like, no broken windows, but it was like a Yankee Stadium pamphlet that they handed out to the Yankee, uh, the people who went and watched the games. And it was like a, dear Yankee fan, I know you're bummed about Derek, so are we. We just want to say we live here. And we know you've heard a lot about the South Bronx. And we just want to say we send our kids to school here. And we've noticed you drink a lot. That's really okay, but you should know that 70% of us have been stopped 
for drinking coffee in front of our buildings. It's not that we're against police, which they keep coming back to. At the end of that night, six wagons showed up, right? Um, and everybody, Brett, who kind of looks like a Ken doll, do you know what Ken dolls are? So everybody felt like Brett, they wanted little Brett dolls in their pockets. Um, so Brad and other folks talked to the um, talked to the police, and there was a retired correction officer who was like saying to the police, "Why are you bothering them? They're like educating the community." Um, and then afterwards, everybody was laughing. Not that the police van showed up, but that wasn't the surprise. But they never left empty before, and that was just clearly because there were a lot of white people, right? That we could bear witness, and so. I offer this as, as one instance of critical par work. It is a long struggle. Stop and frisk is no longer called stop and frisk, but there are all new ways of stopping and frisking and policing black and brown bodies, as you all know if you work with young people better, better than I do. Um, so it's a, it's a long struggle, but this is one of those where we've been in it together. I want to give you an example of doing critical par work with young people and how we train young people to be researchers. It is often the case that when we say to young people, so you're like the experts, they look at me like, yeah, right. <laughs> right? They don't quite believe that that's true. Um, but then we might say, we're going to create a survey of New York City youth. And all of you who know a lot about like the foster care system or the homeless shelters, you take that expertise over there because you're going to create questions. And those of you who know a lot about um, juvenile justice or PINs, please take that knowledge over there. And everything that feels like shame right now, you have to turn that into knowledge because we've got to create a survey for other young people in New York City. And your experiences are the knowledge that are going to create the opportunity for other young people to tell us their stories. So we did a, a citywide youth survey created by young people, and they decided that they wanted folks to know how they came to be youth researchers. There is something magical in all of these projects, and we've done them now for 25 years, that turn when suddenly they realize, like, you're serious, that you're going to take my knowledge seriously. Um, I want to give you one more study, and then, and then we can wander through. So we did a project with uh, Muslim American young people, and I'm just going to show you. I, I, we just simply asked them, this was just post 9-11, and now we're doing an update. Just draw your many selves. That's how we started the project. We gave paper and markers and said, draw your many selves, your student self, your child self, your sexy self, your athletic self, your religious self. Um, and we ended up with hundreds of what we called identity maps. This was a group of kids who, prior to 9-11, were just mostly um, middle class, white-ish folks in the United States. And then post 9-11, they were suddenly told they didn't belong here. So it was an abrupt rupture in their sense of belonging to the moral community called the United States. Different than what has historically gone on with African Americans or, or Latinos in this country. Here there was a sense of deep inclusion and then a, 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 a rupture that said you don't belong here anymore. Not unlike the Japanese kids who were interned during World War II. We found that when we asked them to draw their many identities, Most of them drew images like this, particularly the young women, where their American lives and their Muslim lives were woven together. Where Islam was very much at the center of their life, but a part of a larger um, flowering sense of self. About a third of the kids drew maps like this. I live in two worlds. Kind of like what Du Bois would call code switching or moving between worlds. And then at that point, about 
we're, we're documenting what we call conflict at the height. This being the most dramatic, it's a 16-year-old kid who said, I feel like half of me is American and half is Muslim. And I said, what are the tears for? And he said, the tears of racism. We're, we're now interviewing Muslim American kids who have grown up in Islamophobia here, right? And it's not a shock. It's not a rupture. And, um, and they're very critical, very activist, and very engaged in solidarity movements. They identify as people of color, which I just promise you was just like not such a big thing in 2002. But now they identify as people of color. They're in solidarity with Black Lives Matter, with spoken word, with queer youth organizing, which is a kind of beautiful consequence, but worth noting what happens when a group is told you do not belong in the country. And so young people are helping us figure out how to use this in lawsuits, in organizing campaigns, and in school, um, and in school curriculum. And there's a vibrant online and in-person queer Muslim. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to my, the last project that I want to at least bring in the room and then open for questions. So a few years ago, this part always sounds like a joke, three lesbian philanthropists approached Maria and me and said, we want you to do a study of LGBTQ young people. And we said, you know what, we don't really do like a population because we're interested in dynamics like school pushouts or um, mass incarceration or... Uh, immigration struggles, but we don't, and they said, well, there are two things that we want you to think about. Did you ever notice that the activists in most youth movements, dreamers, Black Lives Matter, prison abolition, education reform, that the activists are disproportionately of color and identify as LGBTQ or gender nonconforming, which is a kind of, I don't know, an interesting finding for us all to think about, right? It's a lot in sociology that would say, oh my God, if you're doubly stigmatized, you're hiding and you're, and they were saying that's just not the truth. What you're seeing is a kind of bold, unapologetic, this is who I am, I am not assimilating, and you're gonna have to change this institution because I'm not leaving. So they said that, and they said, there's been a lot of research on LGBTQ kids. And it focuses on three or four issues. What are they? What's the research focus on? Homelessness, depression, suicide, bullying, right? So it's very problem focused. A lot of the research on kids of color is like, it's very problem focused. And you don't get a sense of the complex, gorgeous vibrancy. So they said, will you do it? So we decided to do it. So these are our co-researchers. You'll see many, many more of them. Uh, what we decided to do was a national, this was totally nutty, a national participatory study done by and for LGBTQ youth with a particular emphasis on young people of color Young people not in school, because almost all the, like, listen to this fabulous work, but you're in school. Trans kids, kids in the homeless and foster care system, because there's over-representation, and the juvenile justice system. And it's worth all of, uh, how, are most of you work with young people? Right? So it's interesting to notice, like, who are the leaders and who's really been betrayed? by every institution and sometimes the people closest to them, right? And yet a kind of vibrant, what we call willful subjectivity, and you'll see radical wit, because they're also really funny. So you'll see in a moment. Um, so we brought together a long, long, long story. Um, first, we brought together an advisory group, half adult, half youth, Almost everybody was of color and or LGBTQ. Artists, activists, and researchers. Then we identified like 50 youth organizations around the country, 
LGBTQ organizations, but also spoken word, YMCA's, um, uh, athletic groups, fratern marching bands, I was a biggie, um, where we knew LGBTQ young people could be accessed because we wanted a sample from around the country and Puerto Rico and Guam. And we wanted questions generated by young people. Got it? So that's what I mean by participatory. You can ask me about this. So we had we we found these fifty organizations and we sent each of them like hundred dollar gift certificates and said, buy pizza and drinks and have a bunch of kids come and first do survey making parties. So they would generate questions and submit them because we're building a survey. Does that make sense? So Missoula, Montana, the YMCA, those kids are sending it. And from El Paso and Jackson, Mississippi. So they were sending us questions that they wanted in the survey. Then later, they would have survey taking parties. And we hired social media, LGBTQ activists to do social media like in the South, et cetera. Um, and now there are survey analysis parties where people now get their data back and they can look at the local issues. So we had over 6,000 young people ultimately filled out this survey. And we wanted the survey to feel validating for the fullness of who people are, not just are you being bullied, are you depressed, are you suicidal. Then we had 10 cities around the country. Each city sent a team of four LGBTQ activists, 18 to like 24, to New York. And together we created the survey, we analyzed the survey, and we thought about products. Is this kind of making sense-ish? Okay, so Boston, Detroit, St. Louis, Los Angeles, Two Spirit, Tucson. All right. So I'm going to give you just, you know, tapas in the Spanish restaurant. Like, just little tips. So this is the philanthropic pickup line. Have you ever noticed that the leaders of major youth organizing movies, Dreamer, blah, 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 are disproportionately queer and trans youth of color? So we had... Oh, this is why our project is cooler than others. I'm not going to do that. So, but it's, it's a national study by and for young people, disproportionately young people of color, trans, um, every state in the country, and then we had 10 local projects as well. So we had survey taking parties. So we finally got what we call the bad draft of the survey, and that's what we always call the first draft. The, and it was a combination of like standardized items, but lots of youth created items that had been submitted from around the country. And we decided to invite a group of young people in New York City to kind of pilot it and tear it apart. That's what we always do. Anybody work with young people? Have you noticed that they're shy about tearing things apart? You've noticed that they're shy about that? No, I have not noticed. They seem very eager to tear things apart very eager to tell us what was wrong with the survey. And they did. So somebody brought their mother. We expected 40 people, but everybody started texting each other. Um, so about 200 people showed up to a Korean deli on 45th and Lex. Right? We were on the second floor of one of those places that kind of smelled like urine and chlorine, and you know, the, the top floors of those delis. And they just kept coming. And Marie and I were like running up and down the steps with rye bread and orange juice. And, and they were all taking the bad draft and critiquing it, right? Um, and one young person said, you know, I've never been with this many young people like me without going through metal detectors. It was just a very... So the first thing everybody did was put up a sign and we filmed it of what do you want the world to know about LGBTQ young people. And then they took the survey. I was in one room with a group of young people talking about difficult issues and should we include, how do we, how do we um, phrase things on the survey? Like now cis and trans and queer is like, but this was a few years ago and I didn't know if that like little gay boy in Utah who thought he was the only person in the world would know what cis and would queer offend. Anyway, so we were having those conversations. 
And I said, you know, we're going to have a list of stressors because we want to see what's stressing people out. What, what kinds of things should we include? And a very gender fluid young person with a baseball cap said, you know, sometimes when I'm stopping frisk and they're patting me down um, and they realize I have breasts, the cops beat the shit out. Like, can we put that on the survey? And then this other young woman said, you know, when I walk down the street, the cops flirt with me. I'm about to curse, so if anybody's going to freak out. Um, the cops flirt with me, but when I'm walking arm in arm with my girlfriend, they say, I want to fuck both of you. And then all the other kids are doing this. Like, that's what happens. Or if I'm, if I'm like rubbing my girlfriend's nose in school, the vice principal say, too much PDA. You all know what PDA is? And did you all learn that? Anyway. Um, and meanwhile, the straight kids are like having sex in the corner and nobody's saying anything to them. So, so it was fascinating. And we decided we need a lot of open-ended questions. So we ended up with over 6,000 kids filling it, and it was amazing. 57% identify as trans or non-binary, 40% youth of color. The young people really wanted to know if, if they considered themselves religious. Not a question I ever would have included. But it was so interesting that a quarter considered themselves religious, but were so offended that their churches or mosques, religious leaders, disregard their and they really want you to know 40% of them are in a relationship. They thought that was more important than any of the other demographics. So the first question, first question was, just give us five words to describe yourself, right? And, and then we create these crazy word clouds. But they're gorgeous. They're like, I'm a nerd. I'm a tennis player. I read all the time. I'm a musician. I'm queer. I'm an activist. I'm a bookworm. I'm neurodiverse, right? And it was just an invitation to say, so who are you? Tell us all the stripes inside you. And then for every demographic question, and I highly, we've been meeting with lawyers and social workers, when you're going to ask someone their gender, their race, their, just start with an open-ended question. And let them, then you can say, all right, if you have to squeeze yourself into a category, which one are you going to choose all that apply? But there's a respect in saying, tell me who you are. Tell me your, and, and we got, I don't know, 50, 150 genders, and I don't know what they all are. It doesn't matter. Like when we deal with um, legal aid folks and foster folks, they're sometimes like, well, what if they write like demisexual? It, it doesn't matter if we know what it is. It's an invitation to say, give us your full self, and I'm going to shove you in a box. So help me, right? And... And then we'd have big fights. So if I'm a trans man, am I not a man? Uh, you know. I would say this is an awkward moment around these categories. That, that young people are blowing open categories at exactly the time where lawyers and researchers and all of our agencies are still shoving them in boxes. And we've got about five more minutes to do that. that because they're not going to tolerate the boxes that we're creating. Um, I will tell you more about that argument in a moment. I don't know. We got scores of sexual orientations. They were really mad that asexual was not listed. So when you do your own work or put together your own, it's a big one. They really wanted us to know that they're more than a collection of struggles. So one of our commitments was to refuse a damage-centered inquiry. It says a long history. Um, but basically, we shouldn't be using language like at risk or like we don't want to define people by what we think they don't have or whose standards are we comparing to. So they really wanted to look at dispossession, the ways in which people have been screwed over, and powerful resistance, right? So they didn't want to sugarcoat the oppression but they didn't want them to think they were only sites of oppression. All right, so I'm going to leave you with some of these, although. So in the middle of this crazy survey that really is saying, are you depressed? Have you killed yourself? Are you, do, you, know, are you with family? Are you with, how are you with the police? We said, if you made a banner for yourself, what would it say? 
and I'm going to ask you to read aloud your favorite ones. And in the parentheses is how they describe their sexuality, their gender, and their race. All right, somebody read. Just because I am a man with a vagina doesn't mean I can't be proud about it. Gay male trans man competition. My PGP is prison abolition. Mm -hmm. Queer, GNC, which, which. Everybody know, I'm gender sorry. Gender non -control. Everybody know PGP, preferred gender pronoun, right? And so we have 6,000 of these. Every night I look at 200 because they're deep hysterical solidarity things, right? Um, anybody else got one? I was born gay. Were you born an asshole? <laughs> yeah, like in the middle of a crazy survey, someone just writes that. We were all born naked and the rest is drag. This <laughs> person really wanted us to know who they are. So again, I have no idea what this means. Gold star, platinum, double mile gay, male with some drag queer influences. Sombrero AF. Do you all know what AF is? Yes. Yes. Why didn't anybody tell me? Okay, Latina. I thought it was like African French. Anyway, <laughs> Latina <laughs> AF. <laughs> Flexing my complexion over white supremacy. A lot of talk about disability and neurodiversity, which is a little cul-de-sac that we're starting to go down. Because um, it's hard to know what that is. Is that kids are taken to shrinks early on, and so they get labels, or are neurodiverse people more open to a variety of sexualities, maybe, and less intimidated by social conformity? And then there are just some facts, like lesbians have more orgasms than straight women. <laughs> Pansexual, primarily woman, female, white, but my father is mulatto and my grandparents were born. And then it's just great to have these because like how am I still here could feel like, oh my God, depression. And then their self-description is black and black, I'm black y'all. <laughs> anyway, so we've got a lot of those. I'm going to tell you three things and then I'm going to shut up and open to, what time is it? Is it tomorrow? <laughs> what time is it? <laughs> All right. Um, I will tell you that getting treated like shit has very bad consequences for your mental health. All right, so the more, the more precarity you have, the more cops, homeless, negative interactions in school, the more of those, the worse your mental health, the higher your suicidality, duh, right? You all know. Um, on the other hand, when, you, sorry, on the other hand, the more discrimination, the more activism. And the more activism, the better your mental health particularly for kids of color, who seem to metabolize discrimination to activism more rapidly than white kids. So it's not to say it doesn't have an effect. And housing precarity is probably the biggest predictor of all the other crappy outcomes. The kid doesn't have a safe place to go at night to sleep. If they are on the streets or having to sleep in a hotel because somebody's going to pay them to be in a hotel, the consequences of school dropout, consequences of school dropout, mental health problems and getting involved with the cops go way up the moment they are severed from a safe home. And the likelihood of selling your body for money goes away. So kids who are, who are stably housed, about three, four percent said that they've ever, you know, traded sex for money. Kids who were precariously housed, it was more like almost 15%. It's just a huge structural issue. So we've been working with the mayor's office. We've been working with um, Charlene McRae, who's actually very interested in LGBTQ young people and depression and homelessness. Um, what's really interesting is if you say to kids, are you homeless? That is not a category they check. If you, they say, no, I'm not home. I live on, I'm living on my cousin's couch. I live under a bridge in New Orleans by the, right? So we, we had to create a kind of precarious housing metric. One more really wonderful finding. We created a measure of dignity schools. Do you go to a school where teachers are out 
where the curriculum in history or English or sex ed includes LGBTQ material, where there's a gay-straight alliance, where there's an anti-discrimination policy, and where there's an adult who cares about you. Kids who go to those kinds of schools, who say their schools are like that, were much more likely to have low depression, low suicidality, low push-out. Those are cheap interventions. Doesn't, it doesn't cost money to invite teachers to be their full selves. We've been having meetings with, there's a group called Out and Proud Teachers Initiative in New York. You are covered legally to be a lesbian, gay, trans teacher, but you are not necessarily covered to be out about that. So any parent or any colleague can di dial 311 and say, one of my colleagues or my kid's teacher is speaking inappropriately about sex to the kids, and an investigation will be launched. That's deep. That's New York City. Kids in the South, very few of them had out teachers, and therefore the school push-outs, the bullying, the mental health, the suicidality was much higher. So we can make a difference on the basis of very little. And I guess I would just leave you thinking about activism as a healthy response to discrimination and how little it takes to make young people feel low. Thank you. Questions, thoughts, blah, blah, blah. Questions or reactions or thoughts or worries or... Yeah. Uh, my name is Millie. I am a um, research analyst with CUNY. I work with the Office of Research Evaluation and Program Support. Um, so youth work isn't necessarily my field as of right now, um, but the, the concept of participatory action research is important to me. And one of the things that I have a hard time racking my head around is uh, who funds it, because anytime I would say like, am interested in doing this kind of work it's always the question of just like well where is the money going to come from and so i'm curious to who is interested in this and will be would fund uh, such work why don't we talk for a few questions <laughs> <laughs> So as someone who also works for CUNY, tell me how you do this kind of research and work within the IRB structure. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Naomi. I'm a student in the East Studies Master's program. Um, and I was wondering when you conduct, so, so this is sort of a corollary to the funding question actually, is so in most instances when you get funding for doing anything with youth, you have to then produce a ton of evaluatory evidence saying that they got something out of it or that they even just attended X number of sessions or something to document that the money was spent on these young people and they experienced outcomes from that. And so I'm wondering in a participatory context, how you develop evaluations that remain participatory and aren't about, I'm asking you these questions that are mandated. And and I'll tell you a CUNY research story. Remember when there was Conrad Hilton money for foster youth at CUNY? Yeah. So there was money from the Hilton Foundation to look at foster youth at CUNY. Anybody work with foster youth? So like, I have a foster son, I, yeah. So it's, it's a very complicated system. So we decided to do a participatory project with, so we just took that money. There were two other groups who just did big data analyses of foster youth, but we had a team of foster youth working with us and, um, I will tell you that every time we've gotten money and we say, we're, we're gonna switch things up a little, 
We'll do a big quantitative study, a small one, a qualitative, but the expertise lies in our pooled knowledge and is really held by the people who have most experienced the injustice, and we're gonna pay them. And that's how we use the money. And if you can't give us money for that, why should I get paid to about foster youth when the young people who are good enough, and people don't often say no to that. If they're like funding social justice stuff and then they hear you're gonna employ formerly incarcerated folks or kids, they find the nickels for that. Um, what was interesting on the foster youth project is because we were working with foster youth, at CUNY there are dorms, foster youth dorms, which is a, a big deal. Um, but if kids do poorly in class, they get thrown out of the dorms and then they lose everything. And it's like one more deeply contingent love story. Like it's not forever love. It's if you're a good student and you stay, then everything, you get your food and then you get your money and then you get your whatever. But you screw up in your classes and then everything, and then you're back out on the streets. And it happened to most of our co-researchers. And we had this meeting with CUNY and with the Hilton Foundation. I'm not blaming you at all. I don't know why I'm pointing to you. But we said, are you investing in the kids or just the student? Like, if you're investing in the kid, you know there's going to be a screw-up. I have a foster kid and I have two C-section kids, and there's always screw-ups, right? And we catch our kids or we catch people we love. Foster kids, something's going to happen. Right? Life's complicated. There's a lot of trauma in our bodies, right? There's trauma in those bodies. And it was, it was a very tense moment because I think CUNY would like to support the whole child. I said, what if we built in that grades are going to go down and don't then make housing, like build, right? I, probably most of the agencies you're all working in have these crazy catch 22s around kids. So, I haven't found that it's super difficult to make the turn, but you could do it lightly. That is, all right, we're gonna do a CUNY project on uh, foster kids at CUNY or um, the ASAP program, and we're gonna have a group of kids in ASAP as our advisory group, and we're gonna pay them, and they're gonna help us figure out the questions to ask and how to analyze the data and what kind of products of use to create. It, the, most of the, the projects I show, showed you today, I mean, Morris Justice, I think they had $20,000. That was it. And it's been going for five or six or a hundred years. As the academics don't get any of the money, we give it to the community. But build. I got a call from a high school that said, right, we're in the most homophobic high school in the world. We need to do a study. It's Montclair High School where I live. It's not the most homophobic. Um, so I walked in and there were 30 kids and I said, and they were all telling me the stories and very diverse. I said, all right, we're all going to create a Google Doc. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 8 to 9, 9 to 10, 10 to 11. Anything you hear that is racist, homophobic, or heteronormative, write it in. And, we're, and in a week, we're going to have a ton of data and say whether it's by a student, by a teacher, or in the curriculum. It took no money. And at the end of the week, we had a ton of data. And it won't surprise you what other kids say, you can imagine sometimes what teachers said. It was a little disturbing. And then I found out Montclair, totally cool town, has a graduation requirement that when, in order to graduate high school, you have to give a public speech about your ideal spouse. So these three gay boys said to me, I don't really want to do that. So it was like, uh, you know, let me just, uh, we're going to get rid of that. But then, so we got rid of that. They created zines from these data. They put up posters all over the school. They handed out a first year orientation packet. And the kids did a professional development for the teachers union. And that took like nothing. And it was transformative for their knowledge to be at the center. So... When you get funding, call me, and I'll help you figure out the language. But I, yeah.
So in our uh, school districts are starting to, you know, they're all doing these school climate culture surveys. And so we're starting to do those with a group of teens from special ed, from the Gay Straight Alliance, from Black Lives Matter, from student council, and from the marching band, um, as well as teachers, as well as parents. And they're adding their own questions. So then the school district does the school, but then we're right having the, all the high school kids write letters to a teacher what I wish you knew about me, right? And so that, and we're going to have an exhibit of it at the local museum. There's a way you can just turn the notion of whose expertise is fronted without sacrificing, I think, the quality of the work. And I think, yeah, so we'll, we'll continue talking. IRB, um, do you all know what IRB is? These ethics boards. So I used to be a real, like, have a, have a crush on the IRB. Like I thought, so important. Nuremberg, Tuskegee, it's so important that we not be unethical. And then IRB, like one weekend, IRB went somewhere and became like covering the institution's ass and not the ass of, right, and not the communities. So I grew a little um, cynical about it. Um, so we figure out ways. It's actually, it's, it's not that different than regular research. The difference is related to your questions. So we don't want our co-researchers to be treated like they're subjects. If Sarah and I do a project, I'm both your, I'm not going to ask her at the end, are you better? <laughs> are you still pregnant? Are you still of color? Like we're, like we're not doing that. When you turn co-researchers into subjects, you've degraded the collaboration. So, but we have figured out a bunch of, there is Monique Gichard, who's at Bronx Community College, has been heading up community-based IRBs. They're working with hospitals, Einstein. And so now the community says, before you do any research, because you've already gathered all my grandmother's teeth and blood and kidney, and you said you were studying diabetes, but really I saw that you're studying schizophrenia. We want to know what you're doing with it. So these issues are popping up. There's a Native American tribe in Arizona where that actually happened. They were told it was a diabetes study. Then they looked, then they, you know, you've got the blood anyway, you may as well look for schizophrenia. And there was an indigenous person at a science meeting who said, Wait a minute, we didn't agree to that. So there are now community-based IRBs that are talking about the conditions under which they're letting researchers that want to know who you are, what you're going to do with the data, who owns the data, especially the medical, because they're banking organs. And uh, Canada, I guess, is collecting DNA on all immigrants. And even the stuff about DNA kits now for rape victims or are being used to find out rapists, but also then some of those women are being picked, locked up for stuff because all that data gets used and you can always guess data are gonna be misused. So the question of who owns it, who decides how it gets published. Uh, and yours, oh, these tiny little outcomes that they wanna know if you're better. So there's the cynical me and then the me that says, so let's queer that, let's like, let's play it. So. For instance, um, we do a lot of participatory evaluations in, in New York and throughout the country because of the Violence Against Women Act. Domestic violence groups get money based on the number of um, orders of protection and calls to the police. So a group called us and said, we're working with immigrant women undocumented, Orthodox Jews, Muslims, African women who are fighting with co-wives, we're not calling the cops. None of these groups are, they're not gonna use those legitimate metrics, uh, those legitimate um, strategies that are only gonna be used against the women. So can you help us create a participatory evaluation to document what we do do? And we often do that with our youth projects. And people do get statistical skills. They get research skills. They decolonize what constitutes science. They think hard about privilege and not just, oh, how sad, but wait a minute, who's making money, right? Um, they gain literacy. And one of the things that we do is rather than just say, how have the young people changed, we interview each other. 
because what's cool is we've all changed from doing this work. I now know a lot about policing around Yankee Stadium, and I know a lot about what those mothers and grandmothers and fathers have been doing well before research. So, so there's a rec when you have to focus on, you know, are you better yet in a world that's undermining everything about these kids? We do it as like a wraparound. Like, what are the ways in which we've changed individually, collectively, but the adults and the young people? So that it's never about um, me turning you into a specimen to prove that my project was a good thing. Does that make sense? And and I think there are like beautiful ways to do it. The, a hundred years ago, I did a project in a women's prison, on college in prison, when half the researchers were women in prison and half not. Um, and we're still like really, I was just on the phone with them, Kathy Boudin is, is one of them, whom Sarah's really close to. And we're now writing a 25 year reflection like on political, um, critical participatory work as like love and laughter and chosen family and science. And we go to each other's mother's funerals and when one of us has cancer, we're in the hospital because there's something deep about do, but about taking silent stories seriously and bearing witness together, even though we haven't stopped racism and patriarchy and capitalism and white supremacy, that there's something powerful about um, being with. And these days, it's all I got. Good night, all. Yeah. <laughs>